It's cold and flu season. It's cold and flu season. Cold and flu season. Cold and flu season. Army of viruses attacking your body. We are seeing hospitalizations and even death. But just how much worse are winter months compared to warmer summer months? Is it dangerous to go outside in the cold for risk of getting sick? Traditional wisdom in many cultures says yes, absolutely. And there may actually be more elements of truth to that than you previously thought. The temperature inside your nose can drop by up to 5 degrees Celsius if you breathe in cold air outside for a period of time. And today we'll discuss a recent study showing how that temperature change may actually matter for your antiviral defense. I'm Dr. Nock, PhD scientist, here to help you separate fact from fiction in health and nutrition. For a long time, the common belief was that simply being cold, like going outside in the winter without wearing enough layers, directly caused you to catch a cold. In fact, we call it having a common cold because the runny nose symptoms of an upper respiratory infection are similar to those you can get simply by being outside in cold weather. It is true that in many places of the world, there is seasonality to respiratory infections disease, where cold and flu season typically peaks each year in the winter months. Of course, we know that colds and the flu are caused by viruses, and you cannot get a true common cold unless you're infected with one of those viruses. But the story doesn't stop there. For example, what you experience as a common cold is actually caused by your body's response to an infection and all of the inflammatory changes that occur thereafter, rather than because of the virus itself. For instance, your runny nose is the result of the vasculature in your nasal mucosa becoming more dilated to make it easier for your immune cells to come out to the site of infection, but it also makes you generally more leaky. There's also increased mucus production to help trap and expel pathogens, so most of the symptoms that you actually notice as the common cold are a side effect of your defense system, not the virus itself. Now when you're first exposed to a pathogen like a virus, just after you inhale it, you won't know it, but it starts to infect some of your cells, and then there's a battle going on in your respiratory mucosa. Depending on the outcome of the very early stages of that battle, it may result either in you clearing the virus before you even really notice it, or potentially developing into an infection that you would experience as the common cold. That in-between zone where you've just inhaled the virus but your body is trying to stave off a bigger infection is where things get interesting. You've probably heard of many factors that influence your risk of getting a common cold. For example, high stress, low quality sleep, smoking or secondhand smoking, or a compromised immune system, among other things. The reason that these things may increase your risk for a common cold is not because they increase your risk of inhaling a virus in the first place, but rather because they affect your body's ability to respond to the virus in that initial battle. Now, historically, there has been an outstanding question of why cold and flu season is typically in the winter months. We have some hints, and it is true that at lower temperatures and lower humidity, some types of virus particles are more stable and stay more infectious outside of the body for longer. Temperature and humidity also affect the evaporation rates for respiratory particles that we exhale, which changes their size and how they evaporate and how they float and move through the air to infect other people. Those things may explain part of the seasonality. And of course, on the behavioral side, when the weather is colder outdoors, we're more likely to gather together indoors in close proximity with the windows closed, so there's less ventilation, less air exchange, and more opportunity for sharing pathogens. Historically, these things are the sorts of factors that people have pointed to for why cold weather and sickness go hand in hand, and I do think those go a pretty good way towards explaining seasonality. New research, however, suggests there may be another biological layer added on top, on the human physiology side. The cells lining your nasal passages and airways have their own defense system. Not many people know this, but your regular nasal epithelial cells can set off alarm bells if they sense a virus, and part of that defense system may be impacted by cold temperatures. First, it's important to recognize how do regular nasal cells recognize that a virus is present. It's obviously not like they can think or see or touch, but they do have other ways to sense their environment. One way is with a detector molecule that is activated and sets off those alarm bells only in the presence of something that is specific to pathogens. For example, there's a detector molecule called TL R3 that watches out for double-stranded RNA. Now, in our human cells, we have single-stranded RNA. So if one of your cells detects double-stranded RNA, that's like a smoking gun that there's a virus present because it's a common byproduct of virus replication. So if one of those detector molecules gets activated, the cell releases alarm molecules called type 1 interferons that float off to their neighboring human cells to tell them to pull up their drawbridge and activate their own antiviral mechanisms. It also releases molecules called cytokines that can dilate local blood blood vessels and help summon white blood cells to come to the site of infection. One more defense mechanism is that the cell that detected a virus releases little particles called exosomes. Exo meaning outside of and some meaning body. These exosomes are also called extracellular vesicles or EVs and they can directly neutralize some viruses to prevent infection. The way they send those messages to their neighbors is because inside of these tiny EV particles they have something called microRNA which when that's taken up by the neighboring cells it can help increase 
increase their inflammatory pathways to prepare their defenses against viral infection in this case. Okay, finally, we can link this back to cold weather. A recent study with cells and tissues grown in the lab showed that when cells from the nasal cavity are exposed to colder temperatures, the number and potency of those antiviral extracellular vesicles are reduced. This figure from that paper compares the relative amount of those antiviral extracellular vesicles that were produced by nasal tissue explants at 37 degrees Celsius, which is normal body temperature, versus 32 degrees Celsius, which the authors measured as the temperature of your nasal cavity after having been breathing cold air for a little while. As you can see by comparing the red bars, there's roughly a 25-ish percent decrease in EV secretion at 32 degrees compared to 37 degrees. However, there was no difference in the black bars, which is the control condition where those alarm molecules TLR3 were not stimulated. They also study the messenger contents inside of those EVs in this figure panel, and similarly, they found that at the colder 32 degrees, there was less microRNA-17 compared to at 37 degrees, and that's one of the messenger molecules that would tell the neighboring cells to turn on their antiviral defenses. The last piece of data we'll look at is where they compared the expression of antiviral proteins directly on the surface of the EV particles. For example, these two virus neutralizing proteins, one of them is called LDLR and the other one is called ICAM-1. Comparing the red bars at 37 and 32 degrees Celsius for both of these proteins found significant reductions in expression of both at the 32 degrees Celsius condition. If you put all of this together, it appears that at slightly colder nasal passage temperatures, there's a reduction in the total number of antiviral extracellular vesicles, a decrease in their antiviral signaling messages to their neighbors, and a decrease in their surface expression of virus neutralizing proteins. Directionally, that all leans toward the message of a colder nose equals weakened antiviral defenses. However, one major caveat with this research is that all of the experiments were performed with either primary cell cultures or tissue explants in vitro, so there remains some work to be done to confirm the extent of the impact on actual infection circumstances. Just to be very clear about that, none of these data can tell us how much of an impact, if at all, the temperature-dependent decrease in EV secretion would have on the risk of infection in real-world circumstances. Are we talking about a 0.5% increased risk of common cold symptoms? 5%? 25%? nobody knows, and you can't say based on this type of data. That being said, it does at least show one interesting mechanism for how cold temperatures may contribute to increased infection risk.